Hello. <laughs> All right, I'll try to tackle this thing. Um, okay. <clears throat> My number one is be honest. And it is the number one for me. And I think it's the number one for all artists. I think honesty is what art is. Um, and, you know, business makes it dishonest. So it's a difficult field as an artist to be in because to some degree, the, dishon the dishonesty of selling something or being a salesperson um, is, can easily taint your work and you can attempt to manipulate people um, into feeling a certain way, playing more, or putting more money into the machine. And, and it's, um, it's a dangerous thing. Like if, if you're an artist, you're a voice and you've got to find your voice. And in, in order to do that, you have to know who you are and be honest about who you are in order to translate your, your, who you are into what you're doing. That's the only thing that an independent designer has over a large company. The major thing. Um, no, that's not the only thing. Uh, but you can't be you can't be brutally honest about this vision that you have for a game if you're in a company of a hundred people. Like your honesty matters not. You know, um, it doesn't it doesn't matter at all. But when you're independent, and you know you're in a handful of people team or even just two people or one, um, being honest is what being an artist is about. And I, I, it's not only very respectable to, to see overall, um, but it's also, it, I think, I think it's just not, it's not done enough <laughs> in our industry. Um, it's, it's in, and I understand it because of business, but not being manipulative and condescending with your work is important. Um, knowing who you are is important and allowing your flaws and eccentricities, if you will, to show in your work is honest. Um, and that's what makes art special. Um, and that's number, my number one. And hopefully I won't rattle on like that for every one of them because we'll never get through it. <laughs> number two is realize that you're making art. You as an independent have major advantages over an industry that invests millions and millions of dollars in products. Um, if they take, make one misstep and they fail, you know, the whole company can crumble. Um, if you play your cards, right, which is hopefully what I will explain in here and how to play your cards, right. A failure shouldn't matter. In fact, you should be able to fail forward and you should be able to fail and learn and become a better designer overall, um, which is an important piece of the puzzle. So I wouldn't change that either. Design from the heart. Um, I don't see this enough, but if you just look at a lot of the games that aren't, that, that, that didn't just go viral and become successful, look at like the, the harder, harder hitting constants like Spelunky or The Witness or, or whatever, um, and you'll see a piece of that person. Um, you'll see fears of the person who's, who's writing it. You could see the, the likes, no matter how weird they are. Adding that just adds a little bit of like, oh, that's different. And I'm seeing that more in their work. And there's just certain things that, you know, it, it allows you to understand who you are and allows the audience to understand who you are. Um, and I think it's important. Number four, take big risks. Experimentation and risks are the key to growing as an artist. Don't be scared of failure. You don't have much to lose and you'll only learn from your mistakes. I mentioned this before. Um, if you are doing this right, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but if you're doing this right and you're just living poor and you're surviving and you're able to get the job done, maybe you have a part-time job or multiple part-time jobs and you know you come home and spend the night working on your indie project or whatever else, um, you shouldn't be caring so much about failure. You should be caring more about just getting stuff out and making sure that it's different than other stuff that you're seeing. Because once again, the advantages of being an independent means you can take risks, especially artistically. Um, you know, I can guarantee that the next Grand Theft Auto is not going to stray from its formula. Um, that would mean suicide, right? Well, I mean, Nintendo takes those risks, but a lot of times 
those risks will never be taken by a large company. But as an independent, you can do something way more ballsy than that. You can come out of completely left field and make something totally new that may be inherently flawed. Um, but the innovation factor will make up for the flawed aspect, you know, and maybe in the future, you'll be able to take that and, and uh, design an even better version of whatever it is, or maybe somebody else will, but uh, that's what it's about. You want, you want to be able to take those kind of big risks. And I'm not talking about, I'm going to make an MMO that I spend 7,000 years on. And I'm sure I get to that in another number here, but big innovative risks are important especially when you're doing quick, small games, which I'm sure I will also get to on here. <laughs> Number five, don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't start an MMO. Your, your, first, your first 15 games should be very small, little bite-sized games. They shouldn't be this grand three-year project. Um, I think there's a lot more value in small prototypes, game jam games, or just less than a year, you know, I want to say three month projects, but less than a year projects. You don't want to snowball into this four five, six, seven year project. It's, it's going to get worse. And you're going to get in the situation where you're like, oh shit, I've been working on this for five years. I need to add more because people will expect more. I've been talking about it for five years. Um, don't do that. If you're just starting out, and you don't have a bunch of games under your belt already, don't attempt to make the next cave story. Like keep it super fucking simple. Like keep things easy peasy. Six, practice. I see even some of the most skilled designers, including myself, fall into this trap of not allowing themselves to practice. And when I say practice, I mean making prototypes, making game jam games, making small bite-sized ideas. Um, even if it's sketching down ideas to just flush them out in your head a little bit, it's important to make lots of little games because not only will you, you'll get into the flow of making games even more, but you'll also be able to reference what's best in those games. Um, the majority of the games that I, that have become very successful were all based on game jam prototypes, flash games, games that I made in a few weeks to a few months. Um, if, if, if this prototype or if this game jam game is just, oh, it's so it's haunting you and it's the greatest thing ever. You can go and make that game a full fledged game later on, but while you're learning or when you get into a rut, I think it's very important to practice as much as you possibly can, um, and I highly recommend it. Game jams are where it's at. There's lots of them happening all over the place. Just throw yourself into it. Even if you're not doing it officially, just take whatever the suggestion is and you just run with it. You'll learn a lot more by practicing than by working on a game, the same game for years. Don't do that. Number seven is make the games you want to make. Yeah, it, this, this is more of like ride the creative wave. There are some times where even I, I'll get in situations where I'm working on something and it seemed like a good idea. And this also goes back to the business and honesty part. And I'll think to myself, people will buy this. And then I, I realize I'm fucking myself here. <laughs> That's because the more I'm thinking about that, the more I'll lean towards just doing something that other people would want, not what I would want necessarily. Um, and I know that it will suffer because I won't put myself as much into it as it was something that was personal that I was passionate about. Um, you need to be able to ride that creative wave through the project or you'll peter out or you'll burn out, um, or, you know, you'll explode or it just won't, it just, it's, it just won't, won't happen. So it's really important to make sure that whatever you're working on is something that you are super passionate about. And, um, something that you're really, really feeling. So you can ride that creative wave all the way through the project and not just shoot yourself in the foot. Number eight is stand out. Um, man, I still, I still don't see a lot of games that stand out. It's kind of a weird situation and maybe like be more specific about what that means. Make stuff that catches the eye, not only visually, but mechanically. 
make stuff that isn't like this game, but cats isn't like this game, but you know, ninjas or dinosaurs. Uh, d- try not to do that. Try to do something that is unique. And if you are doing that, make sure that the theme isn't just so like I'm doing a game with cats, right? But it's about mutating and selectively breeding cats. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, that stands out. I don't see anything else like that out there. I try to make everything that I work on stand out when it, that's just super fucking important to me. I just, I don't want it. I don't think there you could pick up any of the games that I've ever made and be like, oh yeah, an, another company totally could have made that. It's like, any, you think any company could have made the Binding of Isaac? There's absolutely no way. Like, and it's not just me that can do this. Anybody can do this. You just got to push out of your creative bounds and push out of expectations and be comfortable with taking risks and be comfortable with, you know, making mistakes, making missteps and do something ballsy and stand out. Number nine, think critically. 99% of game design is crit- critical thinking. It is true. Um, and there's the marriage of like art and and logic that go together. And it's usually like programmer and, 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 and artist. Uh, that's, that's what I do. That's this, this is the thing I do. Anyway, um, <laughs> you just try to think about every little thing. Think about holes in your, your current design. Think about holes in other games' design. Think about how other games can be improved. Think about why other games work. Um, you'll learn a lot and you'll retain a lot from that. And I, I mean, I think it's really good to be very critical of your own work. So the more critical of everything you are, the more critical you can be towards your own stuff. And as long as you're being honest about it, you should be able to improve greatly as you go. Um, number 10, play games. This is one that I've been in a rut with and I know I should be doing more of. Well, I, I guess it's specifically video games. If you are making games, you need to be playing games. You need to know where the bar is. You need to know where expectations are. You need to be able to exceed expectations and raise the bar people misunderstand that they think that this bar is this like impossible feat that's been put there by a multi multi million dollar studio well that's not true like you just go around the bar and go up there's ways around this playing field and you can do that by you know making something somebody doesn't know that they want (laughs) making something that you like Um, and the only way to really understand where the bars are uh, understand where expectations lie and also fuel your own creative juices, um, play games. I don't know how many times I played, I've actually read something about a game that sounded really fucking cool and it was not remotely that. And I'm like, I gotta make that idea that I had that I thought that other game was, (laughs) because that sounds cool. And that in itself is, I think, super inspiring. Um, I personally have been playing more board games and more recently pinball machines than video games these days. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's just, I'm sure it's just a a rut I'm in with, with video games these days. And I'm sure other people are right there with me, but it doesn't have to be video games. It could be anything game related. It could be D and D. I mean, I play D and D magic, the gathering pinball machines and board games forever. Um, I wish I could play more video games, but for whatever reason, I'm not doing that right now outside of uh, my own, but I should. And I'm, I'm guilty of it. And I will admit, I don't know where the bar is. Am I going to crash and burn? Hope not. Dissect existing formulas is number 11. Um, all game genres have formulas. This is a really good one that I think that a lot of independent designers are doing very well these days. I think you can see a lot in a lot of successful games like Slay the Spire, um, I mean, any kind of deck building games, that's a dissected formula of Magic the Gathering. Like it's a draft formula. There there are so many roguelike formulas that have been dissected and and rejiggered back into Spelunky and Binding of Isaac and, you know, a thousand others. Um, dissecting, Dissecting existing formulas is very important as a designer because you could make football too. It, it, it is feasible. You just have to take football one and then turn it into a roguelike. You know what I mean? <laughs> it gets, you can, you can dissect the genres, mash genres together. Um, 
and you can you can kind of figure out why the formulas work and how they can work together. Um, what you, what you would do to innovate off an existing genre, you know that it's there's not um, it's it's hard to find a new genre, right? But the only way we're going to get there is by uh, leapfrogging off existing genres. You know, you strip something apart, you 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 take the rules, you take rules away, you add some rules, you know, it becomes a different game. So dissecting existing formulas is not only good for a cool game design for prototyping and for whatever else, but it also stimulates your mind. Uh, it, it keeps you on your toes. It lets you understand why things work and why things don't. So it should, it should be done. And I recommend it. Number 12 is grow up. What did I mean by this? It says, chances are you're not a fucking kid anymore. So start making more adult games. Um, I think for the most part, this is happening. I think a lot of people are, are making uh, games for adults and not so much just kids. I think that, I think that that this climate has changed a lot in the past 13 years. And I think there's a wide range of games for everybody for, for all ages, probably more adult games than there, than there were then. Um, so, yeah, but I still recommend it. I still, I, I would still love to see, you know, more Quentin Tarantino's and Rob zombies. You know what I mean? Like I want to see more of that, but there is a lot of that. I, I, kudos, kudos, everyone. You grew up. <laughs> Number 13 is go outside. This is important. Oh, I think even I even said it was. It says the world outside your room is important. <clears throat> Do not stay inside and work all day. Don't. It's horribly unhealthy. Mentally, it will send you into a total downward spiral into depression. Um, and creatively, it will stunt you. You know, you need to experience life outside of this, you know, uh, going outside, forcing yourself outside, as I should say, to do other things and experience life um, is not only healthy, but it will inspire you. It will make it will make you realize something like it's like basically what people say about, you know, when you're trying to figure something out, you know, get up, walk around. It's, it's that sort of thing too. like go walk, go take a walk outside, go interact with random people, you know, go hang out with your friends, just anything that's not sitting at a computer because you're not going to find the answer behind there. You know, the, the idea is not going to come to you, you know, you know, popping veins out of your forehead, you know, staring at a computer screen all day. Um, you got to go out there, relax, have fun, get away from work in order for work to come to you sometimes. 14 is stay balanced. Many designers are prone to depression and mental disorders. Take care of your brain and yourself. Um, yeah, I think this is more true now than it ever has been. Um, we have lost many designers over the years and you it's important to talk to people. <laughs> Talk to people, um, know your limits. You know, you can't push yourself into an early grave. It's, you know, that's not fun. Um, and going outside, hanging out with your friends, making friends, forcing yourself to make friends, forcing yourself to talk to people, forcing yourself to not just be typing. You know, it's the, the those kind of social interactions may seem like they're filling that bar up, but they're not. <laughs> you got to actually interact with real people in real life in order to really fill it back up. And, uh, in, you know, and there's no harm in, in talking to somebody if you need to talk to somebody and there's no harm in taking medication if you need it. Um, or shame, I should say, I wish more people did. Number 15 is stay grounded. No matter how good you think you are, there will always be somebody better. Be humble. Um, I think people get this now. There are so many. There are so many. What is it? Like 30, on average, 32 games come out on Steam every day. Yeah. I think everybody's staying grounded at this point. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's getting a piece of that humble pie. Um, yeah, but it's good to not, you know, get ahead of yourself. But I don't think many people are doing that now. When the, when back in 2009, when they were like, 28 of us <laughs> it was easy for somebody you know to get a big ego and think they were the shit and they could do no wrong um but 
you know, in case you're, you're that type of person, just realize that there's always somebody better and you will hurt yourself more assuming that you know better than whoever you're talking to, because you probably have something to learn from whoever you're speaking to, no matter who they are and what their background is. Number 16 is be open to feedback. This is a big one. And this is something that is, you know, I think is just the almost stereotype of a, of a game designer's folly at this point in time. I won't name names, but I, I was playing a game. I was asked to play a game and they were asking for feedback. And I simply asked the question of why the bomb was a skull. Because the skull seems like something you wouldn't want to touch or pick up. It's a flashing skull and it blows up. But I didn't know you should be grabbing the these flashing skull bombs and throwing them. It just signified danger to me. And I made that comment and they got very mad. <laughs> I was just like, I don't know how, how this is awkward. And um, I'm sorry I'm saying this. It's even awkward now talking about it. Uh, back in the day on Newgrounds, I used to upload a video game. And it would just say, you fucking suck. You suck. Over and over. The game sucks. Controls suck. This sucks. This sucks. This sucks. And you'd read through it all. And eventually you'd get to the point. There was a point to your game sucks. And it was there, you know, it didn't control too well. And it's like, oh, it's like, I could just write this all off as like, you guys are jealous assholes who wish you could be making this game. Or you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have the experience I do. But the reality was I knew that if there's a negative comment and there's another negative comment and there's something between those two that has something to do with controls, that maybe I should be doing something. Maybe I should be looking at what I'm doing and trying to read between the lines um, and figure out exactly what is being said. I'll give you a tip. This is, this is, a, this is a, a pro tip here that I learned over the years. Um, and this is a technique that John Blow also using, uses. If you are not prototyping, if you are testing, your game um, on, on a group of people. Um, do not say you want feedback though. Don't tell them you want feedback. What you do is you watch them play your game and you say nothing. You watch with your notepad and you see what they don't understand and you figure out why. If at the end they want to say something or you want to ask specific questions about what didn't you understand about that? How come you didn't do that? What didn't you do? The moment you do ask for feedback, somebody's going to always feel like they need to. It's a request, right? So they're going to find something, they're going to move to it, and they're just going to say it. Um, my recommendation is not to do that. I, I, I think it's a foolproof plan to sit somebody in front of your game, let them play it, and then just watch. Do that with as many people as you possibly can. You will learn an astounding amount about your game and why it doesn't work <laughs> and how to improve it. Um, I, I, I do it weekly currently with Mugenics and it has been so helpful. Work with people. People are nice. People are good at things that you aren't. Um, working with others is important. There's a lot of designers out there who want to do it all. Um, don't, you know, there's no reason to. It's also less lonely <laughs> when, you're, when you're working with somebody else, you can commiserate together. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a cool little fun, friendly interaction to have. And you will learn from the experiences of the other person and what they bring to the table. And um, I highly recommend you do that. Um, I think pe most people will work together these days though. I think that was, that was definitely like more of an old school. I want to do it all myself type. Number 18 is network. Talk to other designers, talk to fans, talk to media about what you're doing. <clears throat> you might gain some perspective on how others view your work. Like some of the most significant opportunities I've ever had in my life came from just the fact that I was nice to somebody else. It's like, oh, or like, okay, perfect example. <clears throat> uh, Cliff Blazinski bought one of my CDs once, which was, it was a compilation disc, disc of all of my uh, work um, in like 2007, 2008, he bought it. And I think he just mentioned it in an interview or something. And I was like, what the fuck? And I was like, okay, <laughs> this guy knows who I am. I can talk to him. 
And I messaged, I emailed him and I was like, thank you so much for, you know, mentioning my work. It's so awesome that you bought my CD. If you know anybody, I'd like, I'd love to make a console game. If you know anybody at any company that would be, you know, down with an indie game or whatever else, um, feel free to share. And he's like, oh yeah, I know this guy who, who, who knows you. And uh, I think he'd, I think he'd love to work with you. So it was just that little bit and piece, just, just these crossing paths and whatever else. And you'd be surprised. And if I, if I never reached out to Cliff after he had mentioned that, there would have been no opportunity there. But the fact that I did, you know, was hugely significant in my future. So you'd, you'd be surprised. Just talk to people as much as possible. And then it also goes into this, which is number 19, which is be excited about your work. When you're talking to the media, when you're talking to anybody, other designers and whatever else, if you can't have a smile on your face when you are explaining what your game is and how cool it is, I'm not going to want to play your game. Like you should be the most excited. You sh it should fill you with joy to be like, oh my God, this game that I'm working on right now. Yes, it's grueling. Oh my God, I'm working my ass off. It's killing me but I love it. I can't stop playing it. I can't stop talking about it. Um, you can't expect other people to be excited about something you're not excited about. And I know a lot of people who are just like, either they're embarrassed because they don't want to be, you know, they feel like it's self-serving to be excited about something that they're working on and talk about it in a, in high regard, or maybe they're just like over it and it feels like work. But I think being excited about your work, especially when talking to the press or other designers, you got to show that you care um, and being excited about your work is important. I guess it goes hand in hand with actually being excited about your work, which, you know, I think at this point, I've kind of pushed, <laughs> pushed you down to this point. You should be only working on the games that you're excited to work about. If you're independent, you should not be just working. It should be something that you love. It should be something that you are excited about. I look forward tomorrow. I look forward to waking up and coming down here and working on eugenics. It's the truth. I love working on it and I'm excited about what I'm working on tomorrow. That's cool. You should be too. And you should try to find the things that you're that excited about that you want to wake up or that haunt you at night and keep you up. You got to write stuff down so you can remember the next morning or whatever. Join communities is number 20. I'm sure that there's many communities out there. Back in the day, there were a handful of them. I'm, I don't know what they are anymore. I'm not the guy to ask. They've, I'm old, I'm old and they don't want me around anymore. <laughs> but um, back in the day, the communities that was, I, you know, uh, TigSource and Newgrounds.com were, were two communities that I frequented. And I think that they were, they give you, um, they make you feel like you're not doing something for no reason you know they make you feel like you know you're part of this collective um you get to bounce ideas off each other and you get to network which is what we're talking you get to network you get to make friends you get to make colleagues you know you get to be excited about your work and talk about it and dissect the formulas that they have placed out into their community it all goes hand in hand you need to go go into these communities and say, hey, look at this dumb crap I'm working on. I'm really excited about it. Um, <laughs> number 21 is learn a little about business. Business sucks. It does. It sucks. Now, I'm sure there's some people out there who are excited about business and just love the idea of just making money. And that's it. And that's the end game for all this stuff. Um, but a lot of people, myself included, the business aspect of, of things sucks. And um, I was always forced into this position whenever I was working with somebody else, because I guess I was the more social. I don't know. But it's important to know a little about business so you don't get fucked because people will fuck you. It's the truth. They will totally screw you over and you won't know what's going on. You will get the shittiest deal and they will laugh behind your back as they leave. Um, so it's good to know what's going on. You want to know what the average percentage is that you should be getting from, you know, X, Y, Z. You want to know if this retail deal, am I getting, is, am I getting a percentage of net? Am I getting a percentage of gross? Am I, are, you know, is this after this and, and what, you know, how much money is coming out before I get paid? And I learned, I got screwed over a few times. I learned from that, but 
it would have been nice to have somebody tell me like, make sure you get that money up front. Cause you're never going to see another dime. Um, you know, because 20% sounds like a lot, except you're never going to get it because the overhead is an, a make made up number that goes on forever. <clears throat> number 22 is don't worry about being poor. This might've changed a bit because people are more poor now than they were before. <laughs> um, I grew up poor. I was very poor until 2010. Um, poverty line. <laughs> Make ends meet, you know? Don't worry about this being this money-making situation. Be okay with the fact that you're gonna just, hopefully just get by. Few people are gonna buy your game don't invest everything in this one thing that you're that you're doing be, because you know there's a high probability it's not going to it's just not going to pay off in the way that you assume so i guess what i'm saying is if you're doing this independent artist life you're probably going to be working another job um you're probably be maybe doing part time work you're probably may, maybe you're doing um some side work like programming work for other people or art you know I, I did a bunch of illustrations and stuff commissions and stuff like that um i did that all the way until 2010 until super meat boy came out uh, that's what i was doing to supplement my income and then i was being poor and working on projects obsessively all night long with the rest of the time whatever rest of the time i had ignoring my wife um don't worry about it you will figure it out don't make this game that you're working on be this thing that's like your first and foremost financial, you know, this is the game that's going to make me all this money and it's going to be super profitable because it's not. But if you made like 10, 15 of these and you made a name for yourself and you built this fan base over time, you will see money. It took me 10 years to make money off of my work, period. And if you stick it out and keep doing what you're doing and you make a name for yourself and you stand out and you network and you're excited about your work and you join the communities and you're honest and you make good games because you're so critical of your own work and you're so analytical about everything. Eventually you will make something great and hopefully that thing will make some money and then you'll fund your next project will hopefully be even greater and you just kind of go from there. But don't worry about it now. Don't worry about being poor because you're going to be poor. You know, you're an artist. It just goes with this territory. <clears throat> and then there's number 23, which is try to make some money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't want to be poor forever. You don't want to be super poor. You don't want to be, you don't want to have your internet cut out. You don't want that. So you need to make some amount of money. I knew I knew the person who made Celeste, and I will brag about this. I, I still know them. Um, I, I told them, I said, why are you giving your stuff away for free? It's better than the majority of games that exist. And they said, I don't know. I don't, I feel worried about the money. Well, you have to make some money. I will help you get a sponsorship. I'll hook you up with the right person. And I'll get you a sponsorship. And then they made a game called Money Sees, which was on topic to make, you know, about making money. And then Give Up Robot um, and Give Up Robot 2. And all those things got sponsored and eventually funded, you know, Towerfall and Celeste and the future. Um, it's important to make some amount of money. You got to try to, to hustle a little bit. Um, it goes with the learning a little bit about business, but you need to make some amount of money um, and so, you know, selling your work can be weird and some difficult, but you have to do something to make some amount of money off your work. Number 24, which is the final, the final of the manifesto is have fun. If you're not having fun, then quit. You only live once. There's no reason to keep doing something if it doesn't make you happy. And it is hundred percent true. And I stand by it. That was, I think it, when I put this up, that was the one that people hated the most because I think they are so unhappy. <laughs> it's just like not having fun because they're, they hate what they're doing. And it's not to say that. So at a certain point in your project, it's going to feel like work. It, it, I go through these, you know, hills and valleys of, of 
of like, oh, this is so great. And then it's just like, oh, now it's just work to get back up this hill again. Oh, it's great. And then it's, you know, it that's going to happen. And I'm not talking about that. It's like sometimes working isn't that fun at all. But if, if you feel like you're begrudgingly working, if you feel like it's like, oh yeah, I got to come up with another game so I can make another dollar. You know, I got to figure out what it is. And oh, well, I, now I'm got to sit down and work and blah, 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 blah. Like you're not doing something that you enjoy and you shouldn't be, um, especially as an artist. If you're feeling that drag and it's not making you happy, you got to try something else. You know, you don't have to leave the industry, but you got to try something different because you're just going to drop into a pit. Um, and it having fun making games will make your game better. And it is 100% fact. It, you know, it will show having that you had fun making that game will show in your game. And that's it. That's my 24 tips, my do's and don'ts uh, manifesto for independent game designers and artists. And um, for the most part, I think it pretty, pretty much stands up. I could probably shorten this down to 10 bullet points, but that's it.